Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Anyone whom you forgive, I also forgive. Indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, has been for your sake in the presence of Christ, so that we should not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. You know the words from the small catechism. In one way or another, you've heard them so often these last days. In this Christian church, he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. And then in the large catechism, Dr. Luther writes, We believe that in this Christian community we have forgiveness of sins, which takes place through the holy sacraments and absolution, as well as through all the comforting words of the entire gospel. Yet the church created called together by the gospel that gives and bestows forgiveness of sins daily and richly, is a very messy place. And forgiveness is messy, for it has as its target real flesh and blood sinners, not plaster saints, as Dr. Luther would say. And how messy it can be, we see in our readings this afternoon. First, in the text from 1 Corinthians, the apostle is a servant of the binding key. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained, unforgiven, bound to the sinner who refuses to let them go. And so a man in the congregation was guilty of a sin that even the pagans found appalling and abhorrent. Incest. He had sexual relations with his father's wife. Even though he was physically absent from Corinth, Paul is present with them in spirit and by the power of the Lord Christ. The assembled congregation is to hand the man over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh. That is to say that this man was secure in his own sin, fortified in the flesh, which lives in stubborn rebellion against the spirit. And that is the flesh that is to be destroyed. It is to be broken and brought to repentance so that this man might be restored to faith and saved on the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything in the church is set in place that we might have the forgiveness of sins purchased and won for us by the blood of the Lamb of God. And when the binding key is used, it is never simply to get rid of a pesky congregation or of a pesky sinner in the congregation, but rather that the impenitent might learn to abhor his sin and trust in the absolution. Your sins are forgiven you. One of the fathers of the church once said, the church that cannot curse has lost its ability to bless. So Paul says that this man is turned over to the devil for the destruction of the flesh, that ultimately he might be saved. You see, 
God's love is not a sloppy agape that leaves sinners with the very sin that is consuming their lives and condemning their consciences. You know well that some in our day would confuse God's absolution with affirmation. A kind of no-fault approach. We won't condemn you. We won't say anything that makes you uncomfortable. But then we really won't speak the absolution to you either. No wonder that an unbelieving cynic once mocked, the world is nicely arranged. God loves to forgive, and I love to sin. Affirmation leaves a sinner in his sin. And in the words of Pastor Diedrich Bonhoeffer, he who is left alone with his sins is left utterly alone. In confession and absolution, the merciful Lord does not leave you with your sins, but he rescues you from your sins. He frees you from their enslaving power for the sake of his redeeming death, that you might be his own. Live under him in his righteousness and serve him, as the Catechism says, in everlasting blessedness. The messiness of the forgiveness of sins is exactly toward that purpose. The messiness of the forgiveness of sins is also there in our second reading, where Paul is again instructing the congregation, not in person but by means of a letter, to put into practice not the binding key, but the loosing key. That declares, Whoever, oh, whosoever sins you forgive, They are forgiven them. We don't know the details of the case that Paul refers to in 2 Corinthians. We do know that this situation had caused him much affliction and anguish of heart. He had shed many tears over those who would not recognize that the words he proclaimed were indeed the very word of God. But now the offender has repented and has received the absolution, the forgiveness of sins, there's no more room for vengeance. There's no place for holding on to the past as though there were still a debt to be paid. There's no questioning of motives, no preservation of grudges, no wait-and-see attitude to see if this man really is true and sincere in his repentance. Instead, there is only Paul's plea that the congregation embrace this brother in the love of Christ. And that is the way the Lord's forgiveness works. You see, God's forgiveness is never static. It never stands still. It's always on the move from the Lord to us. And it doesn't stop with us. It goes out always to the brother, to the sister, to the neighbor. Any blockage of this flow gives Satan an opportunity to accuse, attack, and destroy. And the apostle knows that this demonic cunning and cleverness would, in fact, destroy the absolution and outwit us. And so the old evil foe would deceive us to believe the lie that we have no need for Christ because we have no sins to confess. 
and then we'll simply settle for affirmation. Or that somehow our sins are too big for Calvary. And if he fails at those points, then he would seek to convince us that we really do not need to forgive those who sin against us. We might be chief of sinners, but then we would sing, chief of sinners though I be, there's always one worse than me. <laughs> and we would see the forgiveness for ourselves, but not for the neighbor. And Satan would have won the victory. But I stand before you today as one who is authorized by the Lord Jesus Christ to tell you that he has defeated Satan. That Satan will not outwit you or have power over you. For the Lord who was put to death for your trespasses and raised from the dead for your justification lives even today as your brother and as your savior. One of the teachers of the church said that the absolution is the verdict of the last day slipping out ahead of time. You don't have to be in doubt as to what God is going to say to you on the last day. You hear it every time you hear the absolution. Your sins are forgiven you. And so even in the midst of the messiness of the life of the church, that is the verdict for you to trust. For it is the word of the Lord whose nail-scarred hands hold the keys of heaven and hell. Holy absolution, his absolution, is absolute. And he is absolutely in that word, there for you, giving and bestowing into your ears and into your hearts the forgiveness of sins. Amen.